Hey friends, Kendrick here, and I am going to be doing my April wrap up today. For those of you who commented on my last video, thank you so much for your well wishes. My migraine is slowly getting better. A little bit every day I have less of an intense migraine, uh, but still have those moments when it's just couch and me and an audiobook and or Hogwarts mystery. I'm on year two. How are you guys doing with that? Anyway, I'll be talking about the books that I read in the second half of April. A couple of them are pretty chunky, so let's just jump right in because I apparently I think I might have a lot to say about them, so we'll see. <laughs> First up is The Nyx by Nathan Hill. This is out from Knopf, and I started this book back in... when was it? I started this book back in November and then Placer changed its uh, subscription type service and I had to stop after part two, which is around 150 pages. This book is like 600 pages. And I thought that this book was just so interesting. And on a sentence level, it's really fun to read. Nathan has a very playful style. In fact, he pretty much makes fun of his characters the entire way through the book, which can kind of get annoying. Um, but I think he's very aware of the tradition that he's writing in and just making fun of that. Uh, this book is about Samuel Anderson Anderson. And he is a failed novelist working as a professor in this like podunk college. So this, so this book is primarily about Samuel when he sees his estranged mother on the television screen throwing rocks at a potential presidential candidate. And uh, he, she like scratches his eyeball like ridiculously, like the entire situation is ridiculous. So his publisher comes to him and says, you didn't deliver your novel, we're gonna sue you unless you write a memoir about your life with your mother. And so he goes and must confront his mother. This to novel is told in different sections, so we get the contemporary section, flashback to Samuel, flashback to his mom, contemporary section, flashback to Samuel, flashback to his mom, and we slowly like move forward with their stories, but also the contemporary story involving both of them, which is pretty interesting. I will say that Nathan Hill gets very distracted by his own characters. He loves them so much. He writes large swaths about secondary characters but i have seen someone review this but so they quoted something from the book and it was something along the lines of that moment when you realize that you're not the protagonist you're a secondary character in someone else's story and you could argue that this book is about secondary characters you have samuel who is pretty much a secondary character in his mother's story and in these other people's stories that of things that happened to them that we learn about there's also secondary characters to samuel such as one of his students who feels that he she he has harmed her emotional state and uh, nathan hill really gets into the voice of that character and how ridiculous she is and then we also have a character who plays world of elfscape read World of Warcraft with Samuel and uh, just how ridiculous that situation is. I feel like Nathan Hill just runs with it and creates these really, really ridiculous characters and loves them. But they have no part in the overall plot of the book. They're not really needed. And so I feel like he just got a little carried away with many of his characters and how much he loved talking about them. Also, even though I loved many parts of this book and many of the parts individually, I'm not sure they all work together as well as I would have liked. Sometimes I felt like they just weren't tied together tightly enough to create as tight of a novel as I would have liked. That might also have to do with like, again, the bloated writing with the, you know, characters. I felt he was doing one giant character sketch and just got a little carried away. But overall, I did enjoy this book. Um, I listened to the audiobook. I would say the narrator really emphasizes the whole ridiculous part of the tone. So maybe not pick that audiobook, but um, it was okay. But the book itself is good. I will pick up whatever Nathan Hill writes because I think he's fun. Hopefully it will be shorter. That's my only request. <laughs> the next book I'm going to talk about is The Recovering by Leslie Jameson. And this is out from Little Brown. And I mentioned in my haul video that Leslie Jameson and I have a tumultuous relationship. I read the empathy exams and was personally kind of insulted because she takes that tone that we see a lot um, where it's the privileged person being like, oh, this person from this X minority group is people too. Isn't that amazing that I've learned this lesson? Like, can you believe how much empathy that I have learned? Just look at all of these things. And I have suffered these things as well. It's just, but I can't compare myself to them. And you could go on. I have. But um, that's basically the tone that she took throughout the entire most of the essay collection. There's one essay I really loved because her writing style is phenomenal. On a sentence level, her writing is amazing. And I said, I just wish she had written more essays like this rather than her look at empathy because it just wasn't working for me. So when this book came out, I was kind of grumpy about it. 
I was like, I don't think I want to read it. I don't think I want to read it. And Hannah was like, well, maybe I should. I was like, fine. I will read the book. So um, I read the book and I was pleasantly surprised because three quarters of this book is actually pretty good. I really enjoyed it. Obviously her writing style is five stars as always, but she takes a look at how we have romanticized addiction in art, in artists. So like Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and just different writers and how we have this idea that their addiction kind of fuels their art and makes it better. But then she looks at how we view women who have been alcoholics or addicts and how our opinions are different about them. Like they are bad mothers because they're addicts, which is like this double standard. But then we also, then she looks at people of color and is like, well, look at them and, and we do not give them the same leeway as, you know, we even do women. And she just follows that progression. And I think she does a great job with that part. That was actually what her PhD was on. But the other part of the book, we alternate between this like non-fiction-y look at this addiction and then she pulls in her own experience. So as this deals with, the, with addiction, um, I do want to clarify that I do respect and admire her journey to sobriety. It takes a very strong person to be able to overcome that. But as I critique this book, I just want to know it's on her execution and on her writing, not on her journey itself, if that makes sense. And I really struggled with the part that was her memoir, especially the first half, where she talks about how she became an alcoholic. And she says in the book, there was no one instance that triggered her alcoholism. She just liked to party and it was fun. So she drank a lot and it just became a thing. She enjoyed it as like a recreational hobby. And she would at as well use it when she was sad or depressed but in a very unhealthy way but not because of a particular instance but because whatever was going on in her life like we all do we all have find ways that we cope with just general life stress and that was hers because she also enjoyed alcohol and she just found herself kind of addicted to alcohol <laughs> because i feel like she didn't talk about how people who do suffer traumatic events and that fuels their addiction that they also have to deal with that emotional trauma to also help themselves reach sobriety and I feel like she just didn't talk about that enough or explore that idea uh, in this idea of addiction. I will say I did like how she structured the book around a Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, around an AA meeting. Um, I really did enjoy that. I thought she did a good job. It was kind of like loosely structured, you understand? Maybe more inspired by is a better word or term for it. I did enjoy that and the way she wrote about AA I thought was really good. But then again, there are some moments, again, that I remember that bring back the empathy exams. One is where she says, I went to this little place called the Iowa's Writers Workshop because it was the only place that would accept me. Sad. And I'm just like, okay. Another time she's like, well, I couldn't afford to go abroad, but I just, I was stupid and I took out a loan so I could go abroad. And I'm like, are you putting this as like a financial difficulty? Like, is that is that why you're mentioning this? Like, what? And she also says that I went to this AA meeting in a rural place and, um, you know, you would think that I would struggle to connect with these people because they're just, I, I expected them not to be as educated. And, but I was wrong. I, I learned from this and you're just like, so there are several moments like that and I just, my eyes like got stuck in my skull. I was rolling them so hard. And you know, Roxane Gay talks about in her review that many people will say that her experience with alcoholism is gilded because she had so much privilege and resources to help her reach sobriety. And I would agree with that. So her struggle is genuine and meaningful, but it's just something that some things she'll say, you just have to keep going, just walk past. Go. Um, but most of this I really did enjoy. The structure is a hot mess. It is too long. It needs to be cut like 50 pages at minimum. But it's I think it's worth the read, especially if you're interested in the topic of addiction. There's nothing that I have read that really looks at it in context of how we view addiction as a culture, especially in regard to artists and writing. So that is, yeah, again, that part alone is really well done. And you could, in theory, skip around and just read those parts if you really disliked her memoir sections. So um, it is an interesting read and it's definitely thought provoking. But um, again, much eye rolling. So I have a lot to say about those first two books. I don't think I have as much to say about these next books. So there are a few left. So first we have Meaty by Samantha Irby. Uh, this is I listened to on audiobook and I really enjoyed uh, We Are Never Meeting in Real Life. 
Samantha Irby is just so incredibly amazing. And this book was her first essay collection that's being reissued by Vintage. And it's about her life as a single 30-something woman who's trying to make her way in the world. And she talks a little bit more about this in We Are Never Meeting Real Life, but um, she talks some about how she's living on her own and how she's had to live on her own from a very young age and how this has affected her life and how she views her finances and different things. Um, but the primary thing I enjoyed about this book is her discussion of Crohn's disease. As someone who also has a form of inflammatory bowel disease, I relate to this hands down. I have been there. Not quite there, I would just clarify, but I definitely relate to some of her struggles. <laughs> So I just, I just love this book and I think she did such a great job with this book. And she talked a little bit about this in an interview I saw about how she wanted to clean up the essays more and how she's like, I can't believe I wrote this or shared this X thing about myself or my body or whatever. Um, but it really creates a very funny book, but also a very meaningful book. And there's a lot of uh, real things here about chronic disease that I wish more people knew. And I was thinking about this the other day is that it's very difficult to describe how difficult living with a chronic disease is. So I feel like Samantha Irby's combination of humor makes it more palatable for people who have no, uh, nothing to compare this to and that they are able to understand a little bit more about chronic disease. It's sort of like sugar, uh, sugar makes the medicine go down kind of thing. I think. The next book is Rainbirds by Clarissa Ginoan and this is a book by an Indonesian born Singaporean writer but this is written from people who have read more Japanese fiction than me. I think I'm not even sure if I've read any Japanese fiction. Man I need to get on that. Anyway uh, I've been told that this is written this tradition is a more Japanese tradition. Jung Yoon uh, talked about that in her review I think in the LA Times book review or something. I can't remember. I'll find it. If I can find it, I'll link it down below. But also Sumaya um, over on Bookstagram was talking about how she thought it reminded her of Murakami, who's her favorite writer. So I was really excited to read this. And this is a combination mystery grief memoir. Ren, a sister, uh, has been killed, uh, murdered in a small town outside of Tokyo. So he travels there to, you know, wrap up her affairs because her parent, their parents are estranged from her and so he's left to him to go and solve all these things. So he's trying to figure out why she died, who murdered her, why no one's investigating this thing, and he's learning that he may not have known his sister as well as he thought he did. So I actually picked this book as one of our books for May. So if you want to learn more about this book, I will link the episode of Reading Women down below. You can go check it out. And this is out from Soho Press, and they do a great job with their books. So the next book I want to talk about is West by Kara Davies, and this is out from Scribner. And this is about a man around the 1700s whose wife has recently died, and then he sees this article in a newspaper about these bones they found in Kentucky. So he decides to leave Pennsylvania and go out west to try to find these behemoths, or dinosaurs, out west, which he believes live there. And by doing so, though, he leaves his daughter behind, and there's this whole theme there about him trying to go find monsters and the monsters were at home in his own culture all along. And we know that he's part, part of this is him trying to deal with his grief and part of this is um, him trying to make something of his life. That there's this one line in the book that has really stuck with me and while he's out on his adventure he says, you had so many ways of deciding which way to live your life and made his head spin to think of them. It hurt his heart to think that he had decided the wrong way. And there's a lot of themes in this book about our decisions that we make in our life and how one decision can change the entire course of our life and how we would deal if we made the wrong decision. And I feel like there's just so much in this book. It's very well done and there's a lot of uh, rich writing in here and themes and context. There's a lot about uh, white settlers moving through and displacing the Native American population um, and how monstrous that was. There's a lot of themes of monsters and how the monsters are not where you think they are. And I think that is very well done. I do have some questions uh, still. I would love to see uh, a Native American a person to read this book and their opinions on it. But as well, the other question I have after I read this book was there's this theme, this classic theme of the angel of the house and also the corruption of virtue that is in this book. So his daughter is back at home, she's a sweet innocent looking creature and there are these men wanting to sexually violate her and they kind of stalk her, they don't kind of stalk her, they stalk her and it's really creepy because they're older 
and they're just waiting for her to reach sexual maturity before they pounce and it's really disgusting and quite hard to read these horrible men trying to do this thing and she, she's she doesn't know anything about sexuality but she knows what they want is wrong she just knows that instinct and i just felt like this idea or this this idea of the innocent virtue trying to be corrupted has been so overdone and while the ending is very different and i'm pleased that it went that direction rather than the direction of say pamela I don't know, I still have questions. I have a lot of questions at the end of this book. So if you've read this book, definitely let me know and we could talk about it um, because I still am just like, I, I don't know what to make of it. But I do think that is a good book. It may not be a Kendra book per se, a book that I personally will love and cherish, but it's very well done. And I think it will probably win awards this year because it's so concise and uh, it has packed a lot of thought provoking information into such a small space. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens with this. I definitely probably should go check out some reviews, right? So those are all the books that I'm going to talk about right now. I think that's enough. Uh, um, I will be back later with more videos, but until then, if you have any thoughts on these books, definitely let me know down in the comments. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Bye.